What's really good? <laughs> I thought you were going to stand. Uh, I was going to stand, but then I saw this water, and I was thirsty because I just woke up. Cheers. And, and my agent tells me that you lose like 10 to 17 ounces of water when you sleep, and your brain doesn't work. So Agent's you drink water man. when you wake up. Yeah, I ate tacos and fell into a food coma earlier. But um, <laughs> yeah, man, let's do this. You ready? On it. Let's go. All right. Hit the slides. Bomb Yo, it was bomb. funny. It's so bright here, we can't see the people. That's kind of a good thing. I can Yeah, I kind of like seeing them. But anyway, so you see this here. This is a drone with Domino's Pizza, right? This is everybody's dream. <laughs> this is every chef's dream. Domino's Pizza delivered to your house by a drone. This is how right? food coma start. Yes. And, and this is how far we've gotten as a society. First, it was milk to your door. Then it was the newspaper to your door. Then it was Amazon Fresh to your door. And now there are Domino's Pizza. There's a new gluten-free crust <laughs> at, delivered to your door by drones. And the thing that we, we, we picked this photo because we looked at it and we were like, this is ridiculous. You could literally live life from your home and never, ever leave. You don't have to talk to the delivery man. You don't have to talk to anybody. It's just you to a robot to a gluten-free pizza. And... Um, <laughs> The, the thing that's scary about it is, is that this evolution has seeped into our news and the way we consume news and the way we approach issues. Because with your smartphones, with your browser, you can literally get certain segments of the newspaper, only certain magazines, only read niche culture, subculture. You could literally only read about urban farming all day if that's what you wanted to do. And in a way, it's selfish because we live in these silos, we think in these silos, and we only seek out news that we want to know about. And there's nothing really policing this selfishness or this lack of awareness of what's going on in the rest of society. Except like the Facebook algorithm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like you, I, I just get One King's Lane and Nike sneaker updates on the right side. Mm, the like Vlad time. TV. Cause, Cause wifey likes to buy furniture, so that shows up <laughs> on my Facebook, but next one. Yeah, Lena. You could end up dying like this bitch. Like, for real, you really, really could go through life and end up like Lena done among girls, which would be a terrible, unself aware life in Bushwick. I don't want to spend my life waiting for Marnie to get home. Yeah. So, anyway, with Lena dancing and all that, you could go through unaware and only wake up with certain alerts. Like, Ebola is coming. ISIS is coming. They're all coming for us. We're all going to die. But unlike the milk or the newspaper or the Domino's pizza and a drone, that, 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 it's really never going to show up to your door. Mm -hmm. Until it does. Right. Next slide. I can't believe there's this guy in full blackface. I just am so... Confused. Oh my god. That dude also kind of looks like Mike Epps. She, uh, true. So good job on the yeah. black. <laughs> no. Who is your stylist? This is seriously my favorite pop culture moment of 2014 because literally Kim Kardashian married a black dude, never once thought about blackface before until she went to Vienna. And some guy's like, in words in Paris, do 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 do. <laughs> and it's like, oh wait, the hip hop. Cultural history, this is how Austria interpreted that? I didn't realize they didn't get exactly what Kanye said. Ninjas in Paris caught a lot of people open. Like Gwyneth, Gwyneth Paltrow, Paltrow got right. caught wide open with the song. Exactly. But immediately proceeding after Kim Kardashian was so confused about blackface, Kris Jenner gets on and explains for the Kardashians' audience the history of blackface. Which was incredible for me as a black woman. I was so proud. That but, was your first choice. For someone to explain yeah. blackface, yeah. your first choice was Chris Jenner. I was Jenner. like, Chris Jenner got this. She's yeah. going to hold us down. Yeah. But... It was close between her and Al Sharpton. It was close. <laughs> right? But the, the great point that came out of this is that, I guess, for the viewers of Keeping Up With The Kardashians, now they know. So stay woke. Thanks, Chris Jenner, for becoming the face of blackface. Yeah. Dope. <laughs> <laughs> now, also, not, not only is Chris Jenner teaching us about blackface, but you have an uninformed, disconnected base of people in a so-called democracy that don't know where Syria is on the map, 
right? We cannot have an effective democracy debating these issues, talking about the strikes, when people don't even know where it is on the map. And because of this, we also kind of have a disconnect with the Electoral College, which there's always been a disconnect with, but especially with President Obama. And we wanted to talk about this because we're in Chicago. In 06, I believe I was the first person to ever make Chicago Obama teas. I was selling them on the train in New York. I was a huge Obama supporter. But I did not vote for drone strikes. And I did not vote for health care without single payer. And I did not vote for him to say in Ferguson or about Ferguson that black and Latinos meant that black and Latino men do commit crimes, right? Sometimes, you know, they, hey. they do, but it's like the way he said it inferred that only they commit crime or that the stereotype about it is true. And that incidence was a perfect time to bring that up, right? Excellent time, excellent time to bring it up. And the other thing is, is that, you know, it's not just me, but I feel like a lot of people didn't get the president they voted for, but that's not Obama's fault. And, and that's what we want to talk about is, that in this nation, with this democracy, with this disjointed voter base, when you look at Obama through the nation's filter, you realize that he was doomed. Because, do I want him to go harder on issues? Yes. But so does, you know, the homie Nashville, so does 1977, and so does the homie Amaro. And just like Instagram, we're a country segregated in thought, entitled to seeing the world through personal filters. And we have been imposing our views and our needs and our idea of the nation on Obama, and there's no way that he can satisfy these right. things. Depending on how you saw this night in Grant Park, which is an amazing night for our country, you definitely saw it through your own filter as the best version of the United States that you wanted it to be. We saw ourselves through this first family, and however you filtered it, you now have a different opinion of what that should be currently yes. in 2014. But the That's problem is, is we're not entitled to, this is not Elena's country or Eddie's country or your country, it's our country and we have to engage and come out of our silos, so. Originally, our plan for this presentation was to have our friends look at this picture from President Obama's official feed which is him talking to a white dude in a diner somewhere in America. I don't, mm -hmm. could be anywhere, right? Could be your town, my town, look, it's America. But this is the ideal. Right, this, this is, is the idea the that there is common ground. There is something that we could laugh about. It is probably, what, I don't know how terrible that hamburger looks. I, I, I don't, don't, I've, I've never seen this happen. Yeah, I, mean, I can't happen. imagine but, that happening. But I do see what's going on in the comments happening. Flames. <laughs> when you look at what people's commentary is on this official Instagram post, people are all up in the sauce about the Gaza airstrikes, right? And about America's involvement in Palestine and Israel and what we should be doing. That's not what's in the picture, though. Stay woke. So originally, we brought this picture to all of our friends, multi-ethnic, different age groups, all across the country, all across the world. Like some you got money, some don't got money. Right, <laughs> some give Eddie fades, I don't know, whatever. Yeah. And <laughs> to a man, the people that ended up uploading their video reactions to this all pulled their punch. Nobody wanted to get down about the conversations that they had had privately about what this picture suggests or what American forest policy, foreign policy meant to them. It was very like, whoa, everybody should get off Obama's back, which, you know, it's a fair and valid point if that's how you feel, but it also reminded us that... I should, I should that feel like we've lost our crowd. Our crowd is very quiet oh, about this Obama. Oh, they, well. they, they it like is Chicago, drone though. Pizzas. They want to hear about the drone pizzas. <laughs> that's what they want to hear We're going to bring it to drone pizzas right? and Kardashians soon enough. But that, that's sort of the point, is that nobody wanted to hear that or have that discussion further than, you know, whatever their Instagram filter is. Yeah, because so. we all want them to win. Like, we would like to see this happen right. at our local Steak and Shake, so... Right, but then this is what happens when you go back in your silo. We have to agree that government can't really be effective if nobody sort of voices what their opinion is. That picture showed us common ground, and that's the ideal that we want to believe about ourselves, but the nation is very fractured, and nobody speaks up about why it's fractured. It's just kind of like, I don't know, I saw some news, and then I turned the TV off. We can't get the government to do very simple stuff like, I don't know, stay open. In October last year, they took 16 days off, you know, lost us $2 billion in productivity because they couldn't find common ground in the House of Congress, our elected officials, the guys that are supposed to have our backs, right? 
we couldn't find ground on how to feed public school children. <laughs> Michelle Obama, who's awesome, was like, let's move. Our kids are fat. This is crazy, right? Everybody can agree about that. Diabetes is awful. Let's institute legislation so we can regulate what goes on people's trays. Stop eating so many french fries. What happened? The I, want, I want french fries. I know. People love french fries. It's yummy. You can't make gluten-free french fries. No, I don't think so. Exactly. So there was a Senate hearing with the agricultural director, and the senator from Maine comes out with a potato and a head of lettuce. And she goes, what does the Department of Agriculture have against potatoes? Wait, actually, I believe potato. French fry. <laughs> this is what we have against potatoes. Oh, Ooh. kill them. <laughs> Kids are fat. It's really basic. What Michelle Obama had on her side that wasn't a head of lettuce and wasn't a potato was Beyonce. Beyonce eats apples in the cafeteria. You can eat apples in the cafeteria. Look how awesome she looks. I bet you she's got a thigh gap. Terry ain't got no thigh gap. <laughs> I don't have a thigh gap. I know, me neither, but I'm working on it though, really hard every day. And so this becomes the thing. Pop culture helps us as a society push certain issues into duh moments, where it's like, duh, you have to get this done. And luckily in 2010, Michelle Obama's pet act did pass the House of Congress and it's being instituted in schools. However, should we lose control of the House of the Senate? John Boehner's like, we should not be judged on how many new laws we create, we ought to be judged on how many laws we repeal, starting with putting French fries back in school. Because what? But yeah, this is how fractured our country is and this is why it takes pop culture to get things done. But we can't lose the conversation. Once he would put them back in as like freedom fries. Right, exactly. Freedom fries. <laughs> Kids need the freedom fries. <laughs> Nothing's more American than French fries. Give Tyrion the freedom fries. <laughs> when we lose the momentum of pop culture, we fail to continue the discussion. We stop at emotion. So there are certain instances in pop culture where everybody is sad. Everybody feels the same emotion and can agree, this is wrong. When Sandy Hook went down, everybody was up in arms about it. How could you murder an entire elementary school of kids with assault rifles? Could we get anything done about it? Nah. In 2014, at the start of the year, 60% of Americans agreed that the DREAM Act was an important piece of legislation. We supported it. We're down for it. Get it done. Have we gotten it done? No. It's because we as a country take that pop culture moment, and then we feel the emotion, and then we can't continue the conversation about it beyond sad, happy, yeah. Well, also, people are scared to have an opinion because they're Everybody always thinking, quarters, what is the right The opinion? bears are who we thought they were. And that's why we took the damn field. Now, if you want to crown them, then crown their ass. That's what happens when we go back in our silos. We are who we thought we were, just like the Kardashians. Yeah, because when we're in our silos, we want to be right on issues. We want to find common ground on issues, but the thing is, on a lot of issues, there, it's not there. There's not a right or wrong, there's your opinion. And then we have to debate it, we have to test that opinion against others, and through kind of intellectual combat, arrive and reach and earn that common ground, because it's not just there for us to find. Pop culture creates windows for dialogue that we have to embrace. We can't resent it. We can't trivialize it. We have to embrace it because it is the most powerful weapon we have to mobilize. And the fact is that MLK's I Have a Dream and Dave Chappelle's reparation skit hold infinitely more power than analytical essays like Letter from Birmingham Jail or ta thorough examination of the matter. The issues and the people need both the pop cultural air horn to get our attention and then the analytical essay following to school us. What happens when we have them both and people do decide to break out of their silos isn't always emotionally pretty. What was your perception when you first heard the news about Michael Brown a week ago? My perception was, unfortunately, the same perception I had when a man got choked out in Staten Island and the same reaction I had when 
when when the man when the man just graduated college in Charlotte, got in a terrible car accident, survived a car accident, went to the lady house, knocked on the door for help. She thought he was robbing her, of course, because he's black at your door. She called the cops, they taser him, he dies. The same reaction I had then. Damn, again, just as fucked up. That was my reaction. Now that's sad. I'm I'm a, I'm ashamed that I had that reaction, because we always had that reaction. For years, that's that's how we be feeling. It's so regular, we just like, damn, that's fucked up again. So I, it wasn't until I read the article. What was it? What was that article? It was on the Atlantic or something like. Uh, it was some article that started off like, America's not for black people. We've known it for a while, but we've ignored it. I read that article and it forced me to like, stop running from it. I didn't even watch that Staten Island video because I, I didn't want to see it no more. Like, I don't want to see a dude. I want to see another black man get killed. I, I saw I saw the Oscar Grant video when it dropped on YouTube when he gets killed. Like, I don't want to watch that. So we run from it because it hurts. So. That was my reaction at first. It wasn't until I read that article, forced myself to watch that video from my man in Staten Island and really understand everything that's been happening and, and give a fuck again. Props to J. Cole. Our CIW youth probably know that's J. Cole, who's a rapper, who's with Rock Nation, Eddie's favorite rapper, I'm sure. But he's somebody that went to Ferguson on his own dime, and that's the only interview he gave because he hadn't really worked through his emotions about what he felt about what was going on in Ferguson. He just got there and wanted to view it eye level on the ground. And that's sort of the reaction I think that most of us have in this age group and in this time specifically in history is that there's a lot, there's a lot. And it crushes you if you're always aware of it, but you can't stop seeking it out because those emotions are good and they spur you to action and they spur you to do stuff. Like show up there, it's good enough. Um, the other thing that breaking out of your silo does, whether it's by choice or by force, is it makes you aware of things that you didn't know you had a strong opinion on. So you didn't know how strongly you felt about drone strikes until when? Not me personally, but a lot of people I know, not until the first episode of Homeland, where she's the drone queen and you get into the minds of the people that are actually victims of drone strikes and you see it through a narrative and you see it humanized, did they understand what this debate is about and did they understand the gravity of what we're talking about. And we need more things like this that immerse you. <laughs> you didn't really know how much you cared about women's body issues and privacy issues and all the flaws with the cloud. Who uses the cloud? Everybody uses the cloud because Apple makes us, right? There's a problem with the cloud. You didn't know until you saw Jennifer Lawrence's boobs, probably. But then it brings us to this conversation about commodifying your own sexuality as a woman and the difference between somebody revealing it on the internet and her doing this pose for Vanity Fair. On June 10th, if you logged on to Reddit or Netflix or Tumblr, you probably saw this, which was a show of solidarity about internet sl slowness day and net neutrality. Net neutrality is our favorite pet issue. It's a huge issue for people in our generation about the government regulating uh, internet speeds, which is gonna affect whether you can binge watch all kind of stuff. <laughs> so when this happened, John Oliver went on his talk show and he suggested to his viewers, who are mostly in the same age group, mostly very liberal people, that if you felt some kind of way about not having fast internet, you should probably lodge a complaint with the FCC. And when he did that, the very next day, how you know it was effective was they set a record for FCC complaints, but you know it was probably John Oliver's viewership because the number of Fs used compared to their normal rate, way up, skyrocketed. <laughs> this now, is a pop culture moment. Sadly, this was a pop cultural moment, and this was necessary for people to talk about domestic violence. Now, nobody feels sad for me. I grew up in a home with, I guess, quote unquote, domestic violence. It's actually hard for me to categorize it because I don't think the word does justice. Um, I know I crawled on the floor and got whipped from behind. I know that my parents hit each other. I know me and my brothers got hit. I know cops showed up at my house frequently. Um, I didn't know it was domestic violence till I got older. And um, the Ray Rice moment really affected me. And I was so happy and excited that we were actually gonna have a national debate about it. But after the first day, I felt all of a sudden that the moment got hijacked and my conversation was gone once again. It was hijacked by talking heads, lobbies, politics, propaganda, and instead of being a story about Janae Rice and Ray Rice and other people who 
are victim to these situations. It became a conversation about the owner of the Ravens, Roger Goodell, and all these other groups, and then if Ray Rice was gonna play, like was he still gonna be on your fantasy team? And it really disgusted me. And domestic violence is such a complicated issue that's constantly mishandled by our justice system that's focused on criminalizing, punishing, but at times leaves families, women, children, and men in situations that are worse than when they started, all in the service of an ideal, an ideal about how a family should function and an ideal that is wrought full of fallacies and stereotypes regarding gender roles and family and marriage and educating children. And I don't have the answers to domestic violence, but I wanna talk about it. And what we saw with Janae Rice is that her agency was hijacked and injected with everyone else's agenda, just like we spoke about with President Obama. You could see what you wanted to see in that instance because people had smart opinions and people had really dumb opinions. But there was no nuanced conversation that sprung out of the pop culture moment. And it was because that was something that didn't transcend culturally until it was on TMZ. TMZ, not the news blotter, nobody cared when it was just a police report. It hit TMZ and people saw what happened. And it became something that everybody could talk about and weigh in on. But nobody went further and talked about the issue itself, why it happens, how difficult it yeah. is for families to bounce back I think back it's from. important for us to point out, because this is our talk, is that it's not sad that TMZ got us to talk about domestic violence. This is our day and age. Right. That's what the previous talk was about. TMZ is now, I guess, the Globe Theater and the Groundlings. And the yep. thing is, we have to embrace the use of pop culture if this is the only thing we have to get people to talk about issues like domestic violence. Hit it. All right. The financialization of the economy is essentially to be seen as a process of the subsumption of the processes of communication and production by linguistic machine. The economy has been invaded by immaterial semiotic flows and transformed into a process of linguistic exchange. Simultaneously, language has been captured by the digital financial machine and transformed into a recombination of connective operational segments. The techno-linguistic machine that is the financial web is acting as a living organism and its mission is drying up the world. All right. That, that sounded is, like a Lupe Fiasco song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is Franco Berardi, all right? That's also not how to explain an idea, but if you have time, read Franco Berardi, The Uprising. His entire book is about how language has been hijacked by poetry and that the meaning of words has been twisted and distorted by poetry, just like the economy has been hijacked by the financial sector and the stock markets. And the value of things as they are in our world today is not their actual value in the economy. The value of a grain of rice, the value of a potato is not the actual value it is. Same with the news. The news has us watching things that probably don't have sufficient value to be hitting us with every single day. Um, Oscar Pistorius, that is a sad story, that's a story that needs to be worked out, but does that hold the value that needs to be in every single 24-hour news cycle? Ebola is very important, but you know the, that there's a mechanism in place for how the media assigns value to its story. So the thing that hits first, or the thing that is above the fold in the newspaper, the thing that's on the cover of the magazine, or the thing that has the biggest space on the website is the important story that people have decided is the thing that's gonna make that news company money. If you click that, if you watch that, that's how we keep you hooked, that's how we can throw in this advertising, it's cool. But our issues in our society are constantly hijacked by the news because the values are disproportionate. Correct. Mm -hmm. We have to take that back <laughs> through our own pop cultural mechanisms. We deal with this because people are able to personalize certain things to you in a way that you can consume very easily. It's a news that they put in front of your face and you eat it because it's right there. NFL, pink, breast cancer. Breast cancer is bad, right? Here's some money. We all hate breast cancer. The problem is that breast cancer is not the most fatal of cancers. However, it's the most highly funded research cause. Lung cancer is the most fatal of all the cancers, and it's one of the poorest funded ones because you can't wear like a black lung jersey. Or we could make Zoolander 2 about black lung. <laughs> that would happen. We personalize the news on purpose because that's what gets you to tune in, right? And so Bill Maher brings Jay-Z on and you talk about a bunch of things, but Jay-Z is what gets you to watch, right? 
You personalize your new, right? <laughs> yes. Yep. Yep. We personalize it. We stylize it with Timberlands. Right. And we're over time, but we just want to leave you and say, the most important thing that we can tell you today is to use every tool available to you. No holds bar to entertain people, draw them in, and get them out of their silos so that we can start having these discussions. Thank you. Bang, bang.